to ensure that the national government does not default on its obligations, the Division of Revenue Act 2024 ought to be amended to reflect the revenue that the national government is capable of transferring to the counties in view of the current reality. Failure to amend the Division of Revenue Act 2024 shall result in the national government owing a financial obligation which it cannot clearly meet. In addition to the proposed reconsideration of the current allocation of Revenue Bill 2024 by the Senate, it is expected that the Chairperson of the Budget and Appropriations Committee shall introduce a bill to effect necessary amendments to the Division of Revenue Act 2024. On Supplementary Estimates 1, with regard to the monies already appropriated by the House to finance the budget for the year 2024-25, I wish to remind the House of the notification I issued on 12th July 2024, informing you of the submission of the first supplementary estimates for the financial year 2024-25, which I referred to the Budget and Appropriations Committee and the Departmental Committees for expedited consideration. The supplementary estimates seek to rationalize the financial year 2024-25 budget estimates to align with the revised physical framework and actualize expenditure cuts across the three arms of government, constitutional commissions and independent offices. As guided in my notification on 12th July 2024, the Budget and Appropriations Committee is expected to table its report on the Supplementary Estimates 1 on or before tomorrow, Wednesday 24th July 2024. The House shall thereafter consider the said estimates and the result and legislation to give effect to the revised physical framework and the proposed expenditure reductions. The House is accordingly guided, and I thank you. Members of the bar, take the nearest seats before the next communication. Yes, uh, Honorable Junet. Speaker, I wish it to comment on this matter. If you know communication from the chair is never debated. Mr. Speaker, it's true, but this is a very, very weighty matter, Mr. Speaker, the, the memorandum from the President on the Finance Bill. Yes. For the simple reason, Mr. Speaker, first, when you look at this memorandum, you realize that Kenyans have not yet come to understand very well on how Parliament operates. Mm -hmm. What stages that a bill goes through? The first reading, second reading, third reading, and also when what happens when a bill is presented to the president for assent. So, Mr. Speaker, we used to have, as a friend of mine said that yesterday, that of a colleague of mine, we used to have op open days in Parliament where people used to be taken through these processes of the bill making, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is a very, very important decision that has been made on a very important bill in this country, Mr. Speaker. And you know very well, before we went on recess, how emotive and how controversial this bill was, Mr. Speaker. And there are people in the country, our voters, who believe that this bill is, is, getting, is becoming a law, Mr. Speaker. They believe that this bill is going to be implemented. But, Mr. Speaker, and this is unprecedented situation because this is the first time since I came to this parliament 10 years ago that a bill, the president has deleted every clause of a bill, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure whether he has deleted even the title of the bill. We need to check that in the memorandum. But he has deleted every clause of the bill, Mr. Speaker. It's unprecedented. It has never happened. In the last 10 years, we used to have a memorandum that comes to the House where the president could have issues with one clause, two or three clauses. This is the first time that a whole bill has been deleted. What does that mean, Mr. Speaker? If you ask me as a, as a legislature here, because you have to raise two-thirds numbers to undo what he has recommended, according to me, this bill is... Uh, what, what do they say? Dead as a dodo, Mr. Speaker. They say dodo is an animal that used to live in Malaysia 
which is instinct now. So the bill is instinct as we. Uh, uh, Malaysia, Madagascar. Madagascar, you are right, Mr. Speaker. It's Madagascar. So, Mr. Speaker, this bill, as we speak, is dead because I don't think we have the capacity to raise two thirds in this house. And we don't intend to, to do, because of the whip, I will not provide the two-thirds from our side, to, to undo what the President has done. So, Mr. Speaker, it is very important to give clarity to our voters, to give clarity to Kenyans that this bill is dead. We only need to agree on a burial date where we are going to do the, the, the burial rites, and we bury it properly, and we forget about it. In our area, it's called Ter Teruburu. We just do the terrible Thank and we you. finish with this thing, Mr. Speaker. We've made your point. Okay. Give him the mic. My last point is this, Mr. Speaker. In your communication also, other than the, the issues that came back from the presidency, is the issue of uh, how to deal with the supplementary budget one and uh, the county revenue allocation. Mr. Speaker, I want to urge this house again. Let us look at those things objectively. It is this house that can know where to cut that money from in the budget, Mr. Speaker. And I want to urge the budget committee to sit down and look with a tooth comb the budget that was passed and make sure that we remove excess baggage and excess fat from areas that Kenyans don't need money for. Let us not touch issues that are very important to Kenyans. That is the work of the budget committee. Let them stand up to the occasion and the majority leader has been a budget chairman for seven years. He knows. He can guide them. Let us not uh, cut the money from where we think the, the Kenyans Thank will feel you. paid. So, Speaker, with those few remarks, I, I agree the deletion, and I am, will be presiding over the burial of that, uh, that bill uh, when it is brought here. Honorable members, I'm not opening debate on this. The communication is not to elicit debate. But Junette is right. The mischievous and misleading comments about the fate of the bill upon rejection unfortunately came from some of our own members here. Members continued churning out fake news to the public about the fate of the bill to the effect that within 14 days it was going to become law which was false. One senior member even sent me a draft bill to repeal the finance bill that was not an act of law. And I politely reminded him that you cannot repeal an existing act. You cannot repeal a rejected bill. And uh, this point comes home to all of us. The finance bill was the genesis, probably the catalyst of the events that we have witnessed in the country. Continuing to churn fake news about the finance bill is to compound the problem in the country. So I urge all of us to follow the procedure. Junette, you are right that it might be difficult for any member proposing to save a clause in the bill to raise two-thirds majority, knowing how this house operates. But under the Constitution and the standing orders, we must go through the entire rigmarole to make sure that the bill comes back to the House. You sit as a committee of the whole. You consider each clause. If there is nobody challenging the deletion by the President, you vote with a simple majority present and voting, meaning our quorum number being 50, Half of that is 25. They can vote to 26, can vote to support the President's memorandum. Any one of you who wants to serve any part of the bill, including the title, marshal 233 members when it comes so that you can vote to serve it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh Club. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wish to, on behalf of the Finance Committee, to report that we've already met as a committee and done our report, and we are ready to table tomorrow morning. Mr. Speaker.
Excellent. Then we will finish it even faster. Members on their feet, take your seats. I have another message to deliver. Bowen, stop greeting colleagues and take a seat. Honorable members, the second message from His Excellency the President is on nomination of persons for appointment to the offices of cabinet secretaries. Honorable members, standing order 421 relates, relating to message from the President provides that the Speaker shall read to the House any message from the President delivered to the Speaker for communication to the House. In this regard, I wish to convey to the House that I have received a message from His Excellency the President notifying the nomination of various persons for appointment to the offices of Cabinet Secretaries. In the message, His Excellency the President conveys that in excess of powers conferred on him by Articles 152.2 of the Constitution, as read together with Articles Sections 3 and 5, of the Public Appointments Parliamentary Approval Act 2011, he nominates various persons for appointment to the aforementioned offices. For clarity, Article 152.2 of the Constitution states, and I quote, The President shall nominate and with approval of the National Assembly appoint Cabinet Secretaries. The names of persons submitted to this House for approval, for appointment, as Cabinet Secretaries are as follows. Honorable Professor Kithure Kindiki, EGH, Cabinet Secretary, Ministry of Interior and National Administration. Dr. Deborah Mulongo Barasa, Cabinet Secretary, Ministry of Health. Honorable Alice Wahome, EGH, Cabinet Secretary, Minister of Lands, Public Works, Housing, and Urban Development. Dr. Julius Migos Ogamba, Cabinet Secretary, Minister of Education. Honorable Rosalinda Soipan Tuya, AGH, Cabinet Secretary, Ministry of Defense. Dr. Andrew Mwihia Karanja, Cabinet Secretary, Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock Development. Order. 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 On order. Honorable. Honorable Rosalinda Soipan Tuya, AGH. Cabinet Secretary, Ministry of Defense. Dr. Andrew. Mwehia Karanja, Cabinet Secretary, Minister of Agriculture and Livestock Development. Order, Honorable Members. Order. Order. Honorable Aden Bare Dwale, EGH, Cabinet Secretary, Minister of Environment, Climate Change and Forestry. Order. Mr. Order, honorable members, order. 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 I shall not repeat. Order. Honorable Eric Murithi Muga, Cabinet Secretary, Minister of Water, Sanitation and Irrigation. Mr. Davis Churchill, EGH, Cabinet Secretary, Minister of Roads and Transport. Dr. Margaret, Dr. Margaret Nyambura Ndungu, Cabinet Secretary, Minister of Information, Communication, and the Digital Economy. In view of the foregoing and pursuant to the provisions of Section 8 of the Public Appointments, order, 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 honorable members, order. Honorable members, in view of the foregoing and in pursuant the provisions of Section 8 of the Public Appointments Parliamentary Approval Act of 2011, as read together with the Standing Order 423, 
I hereby refer the message from the President together with the curriculum vitae of the nominees to the Committee on Appointments. Order, Honorable Members. Order. Order, Honorable Members. Can we listen to the communication? Honorable Members, Section 8 of the Public Appointments Parliamentary Approval Act 2011 provides that unless otherwise provided in law, the committee to which such nomination is referred shall consider the matter and table a report in the House within 28 days. It is therefore imperative that the Committee on Appointments immediately commences the process of considering or consideration of the nominees. The Committee on Appointments is expected to immediately notify the nominees and the general public, commence the necessary approval hearings, and table its report in the House soonest to enable the House to consider the nominees within the stipulated timelines. I thank you. Next. No. Order. Yes, yes. Yes, Jeanette, order. Order, honorable yes, members. Jeanette, what is it? Huh? Yeah. Mr. Speaker. Order. Mr. Speaker. I'll come to you. Yes. Order members. Yes, Jeanette. Mr. Mr. Speaker, Kaluma. Mr. Speaker, they normally say in Parliament, what you communicate is what is communicated and that is what is final. But I'm not sure whether this list is the same one, Mr. Speaker. We cannot change your records in Parliament, but we are really in doubt whether this is the real one. But we shall wait. Mr. Speaker, having said that, Having said that, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I want to speak on this matter and say this. Mr. Speaker, this time and this period in Parliament, Mr. Speaker, I want to tell members, my colleagues, that vetting of this CSS is not going to be business as usual. This time, Mr. Speaker, this time, Mr. Speaker, and this time, Mr. Speaker, I repeat for the third time, if somebody is not suitable, if somebody is not capable, if somebody doesn't have the capacity, we are going to throw him out, Mr. Speaker. We must do justice to Kenyans, Mr. Speaker, and we must do our work properly this time, Mr. Speaker. And and regional, Mr. Speaker, and regional, I participated in the vetting of the last years, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> we know what people Order. told us in that vetting, and we know their people have come back. If your records of uh, of uh, net worth is not colluding or is not balancing, Mr. Speaker, just know we will throw you out of the window, not even the door. Mr. Speaker, the responsibility of making sure who is suitable and who meets the requirement of becoming a CS is vested in this House, Mr. Speaker, through the Parliamentary Approval Act. Mr. Speaker, Jeanette, I'm finishing, Mr. Speaker. You are a member of the vetting committee. Mr. Speaker, I'm concluding. I'm concluding, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is this House that is going to make sure... Add it to next time. It, it is this House that is going to make sure, Mr. Speaker, Kenyans get value for their money. It is this House that is going to make sure, Mr. Speaker, if you know brothers and sisters who have been nominated, if you know you don't qualify, please leave early before you come to this house. This time we will, we will, we will put you in front of Kenyans bare, Mr. Speaker. Bare. Naked bare, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Kenyans are tired. And Kenyans are saying that they, they don't mind anybody becoming a CS. They want to have CSs in offices, but they want to have the right people who are qualified, Mr. Speaker. And we are going to, to do our constitutional mandate, Mr. Speaker, to make sure, especially, especially, for those who are in offices before and who have been brought back, you will see what we are going to do to you people, Mr. Speaker. With those feedbacks, Mr. Speaker, I am prepared for the vetting committee.
Tukutane na hiyo watu mundu kumundu. Mundu kumundu. Mundu kumundu. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, come get. Remember, honorable members, we don't debate communication such as this. Yes, come get. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I... While what you've read could be uh, 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 contradictory to what we had the president announce, well, I would like you, Mr. Speaker, to confirm, indeed, uh, 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 that what you've read is actually, is actually what was communicated by the head of state. Number two, Mr. Speaker, I have heard the Honorable Junet threatening those cabinet nominees. He, the Honorable Junet, Mr. Speaker, while the, bar, while the bar must be raised high for anyone appointed to cabinet, Mr. Speaker, or any other public position, we do not also expect that we are going, or His Excellency the President is going to appoint angels into cabinet. So, uh, in as much as Honorable Junet is here threatening those nominees, even him, Honorable Junet, he who comes to equity must come with clean hands. And therefore, he must not stand here and threaten the careers of other Kenyans as if he's, the, as if he's a very clean man. Even him, at, at, we, know, we, know, we know him also, Mr. Speaker. Order. Order. <laughs> there is no motion against him here. Yes, Sunguli. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank you for the message that you have delivered and I want to say that I'm sure that this time the list is very correct. And on behalf of the people of Narok, I want in advance to congratulate Honorable Soipan Tuya for coming back to a very important ministry. Order, Sunguri. <laughs> Order. So Ipan is not our minister yet. She's only proposed. Kibarek? Order. Order. Let's hear Honorable Kibarek. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I want to, I want to, Mr. Speaker, will it be in order for the House to revert those seers as who have been vetted by the same House uh, previously? My second point, Mr. Speaker, is there is many rumors going around that there is a broad-based government, Mr. Speaker. Is there a possibility that Mbadi doesn't want to sit because maybe it will be something in, this, in the next uh, coming days, Mr. Speaker? <laughs> maybe, maybe the arrogance has started getting, <laughs> getting to his head, Mr. Speaker. Or, Mr. Speaker, or maybe the humility, because I know but is a very humble guy. Maybe, I don't know, or maybe Junet, or maybe Junet is an interested party, Mr. Speaker. Uh, yes, Kibarak. Mr. Speaker, I was asking it. I was asking, is it in order to revert those years who have been vetted before, Mr. Speaker? Lastly, Mr. Speaker, in the same house and the same parliament to revert the CSS for the second time. And thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order, Honorable Kiborek. Under uh, the Constitution and the Public Appointments Parliamentary Approval Act, everybody, whether they were in the dismissed cabinet or not, once reappointed, must be vetted by this House. In effect, the Public Appointments Parliamentary Approval Act says the persons to be vetted include those appointed and reappointed. That is the law. So those who have been reappointed, of course I've read in the, some public fora whether persons who have been reappointed after dismissal qualified to be so reappointed. Again, the answer is in the affirmative. Unless you have been dismissed for breaching chapter 6 of the Constitution. Unless you have been dismissed for violating the Constitution. 
and being unaccountable in the management of public resources. The dismissal assigned no reasons for the dismissal, and therefore they are eligible for reappointment, and under the Public Appointments Parliamentary Approval Act, you will vet them and vote on their reappointment. Dr. Nikal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last time you nearly <laughs> assaulted me on the chair because I didn't give you time to speak. Thank, thank you to I you hope now me. it mitigates everything. Yes. Mr. Speaker, what we are discussing is so important because it is actually the crux of the matter of what is happening in the country today. The ministers, the cabinet secretaries, were dismissed from public pressure because due to public pressure apparently clearly the public going by what was happening had actually lost confidence in the government and when they invaded parliament this was a loss of confidence and the, in, on parliament and its credibility therefore Mr. Speaker the process that is now reversing that must start in the most transparent way without doubt absolutely. Mr. Speaker, what the President announced is definitely different from what you have read to us. Mr. Speaker, at that point alone, the public will not really ha have confidence in what we are doing unless probably the President came and first of all made the changes. He has the appeal to do that. But what the public knows of the people we are going to vet is actually what he announced. Now, what we are going to vet now is totally different. Mr. Speaker, what the people believe, whether they are right or wrong, is important. People act from their belief. And when they were running and attacking at the, the National Assembly, it is arising from their deep belief that we do not represent their interest, we are not credible to them. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, I find, and you really need to clarify this, why the list you have read to us is different from what the President read. We are starting from a very weak point on that basis alone, Mr. Speaker. We really need to preserve this country, and particularly this House. The challenges are going to be bigger. Leave alone the issue that you, you dismiss people and then you bring them back. The question is, why did you dismiss them in the first place? But leaving thank that aside, you, Mr. Speaker, that, that credibility is required. We should have the same list, Mr. Speaker. Honorable, uh, Honorable Dr. Nikal, as a House of Parliament, we are a House of Record. And the record we have is a communication from the Executive Office of the President. And it must be in writing and signed by the President. And it is right here. That is the President's signature, you can see. And that is the communication letter from the Head of Public Service. The President, like anybody else, has the right to change his mind on what he has decided. What is important is the record that comes to this house. And the record that has arrived in this house is what I have read to you. Remember that nobody will become minister, one, until and unless the president has written to parliament, two, until parliament has sat in committee and vetted and three, until the whole House has voted on the report of the vetting committee. That is what is important, Honorable Nikal. We have had cases before where members were pronounced on media as having been appointed as ambassadors, and we have received communication that shows that they have been transposed from one station to another and we have vetted them without question. In any case, the proposed names that I've read to you are not ministers until 
you pass in this house. So there's nothing inconsistent. Yes, Kaluma. I thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, I'm not fortunate to sit in the committee of, uh, on appointments. But, you, but, 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 Honorable Speaker, let me um, tell the members of that committee uh, something the High Court said a short while back as they go into that critical process before I make my last comment. They include you as truly here. I'm yes, the chair I, of that committee. You, you are the chair? Yes. You are the chair. And I'm uh, your loyal assistant, Honorable Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Honorable Speaker, in the year 2018, this is what the High Court said regarding public appointments under the new constitution. And I quote Honorable Speaker, that August 27, 2010, ushered in a new regime of appointments to public office, whereas the past was characterized by open corruption, tribalism, nepotism, favoritism, scrapping the barrow, and political patronage. The new dispensation requires a break from the past. The Constitution... Sorry, Honorable Speaker. The, the Constitution signifies the end of jobs for the boys era. Article 10 sets out the values that must be infused in every decision-making process. Honorable Speaker, I'm saying this is a critical reminder to us because we are at a point in time when the nation is looking unto this house to provide the leadership it needs. Honorable Speaker, it is for this reason that last week, even as the ODM party, independent parties of Azimi also, we sat and said that the government of Kenya belongs to all of us. And Honorable Speaker, we met as ODM and we resolved it. I'm saying this because I don't want some confusion I've seen circulating. Somebody writing saying, if members of the ODM party are appointed to government, they are going on their own. We met and resolved so. And, 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 and Honorable Speaker, don't say no. When the ODM party speaks, even as the Mio has spoken, Honorable Speaker, there is a tendency coming up in this country. Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, let me explain to these people the law. Let me explain to these people the law. I will speak. Order. Order. Honorable Speaker. Order. Honorable. Honorable members. Honorable Jalas. Yes. Yeah, we want to speak. Huh? The, this is not a baraza in Langata. This is a house of parliament. Go on. Honorable, honorable, let me address, honorable speaker, what is in Article 232 of the Constitution. It says the public service will have the face of Kenya. All ethnic communities will be there. Persons of the gender quotas prescribed under Article 27 will be there. Honorable Speaker, as a person from an ethnic community, I will not agree to a position where people say everybody is in the government of Kenya except Lewis. Yet Lewis also pay taxes. Honorable Speaker, I therefore, I therefore want to congratulate the President for the appointment, but request the President that within the week, as soon as tomorrow, we want to see those other appointments Baba was to forward to him. And, and, and we want all of them approved. And Honorable Speaker, if that can happen, then we are going to push this thing very fast. We cannot leave anybody out. And, and, and Honorable Speaker, Speaker, let me send a warning. We want to tell people sending conflicting positions from the ODM to remember that they are on an interim position in those positions. We can remove them if we resolve a position and then they contradict it. This one has to happen for the good of the nation and we are telling the government we are ready to serve to secure that Kenya moves properly. Thank you, Honorable Speaker.
Order, order, honorable members. Order. Next order. Next order. Next order. Order, honorable members. Order. 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 That order of messages is over. Order. Honorable Winner, take your seat. Order, honorable members. We'll now go back to order number two, where I have a communication. The messages are over. The message on finance bill and appointments is over. Honorable members, I have a communication. Order. Order, honorable Were. Order. This is a communication on allegations of bribery of members of parliament in the discharge of parliamentary duties. Order. I don't want any assistance. Just do the listening, let me do the talking. Honorable members, I wish to inform the House that my office is in receipt of correspondences dated 24th and 25th June 2024 from various members of Parliament regarding allegations of bribery of members of Parliament during the voting on the Finance Bill, National Assembly Bill Number 30 of 2024. The House the Honourable Members include the Honourable Joseph Munyoro MP, the Honourable Joses Koskel El Mengit MP, the Honourable Jen Kagiri MP, the Honourable Kanyuida Mutunga PhD MP, and the Honourable Didimas Wekesa Baraza MP. The Honourable Didimas Baraza MP also raised the matter on the floor of the House on Wednesday, 25th June 2024. In their complaint, the members allege that on Sunday, 23rd June 2024, the member for Juja, the Honorable George Koimburi, MP, was quoted across various media outlets claiming that members of this House who voted in support of the second reading of the Finance Bill, National Assembly Bill Number 3rd of 2024, were bribed with 2 million shillings each to do so. The affected Honorable Members sought my guidance on how to address this matter in their estimation, the assertions attributed to the Honorable Koimburi, if left unsubstantiated, continue to bring shame and odium to members of Parliament and paint the entire House in bad light. Honorable Members, you will recall when the matter was raised on the floor of the House, I did undertake to give a considered ruling at the next sitting of the House, which is today. In a related development, I wish to inform the House that I have also received a letter dated 22nd July 2024 from the Honorable Koimburi, titled Apology Letter. The letter indicates as follows, I quote, I, George Koimburi Ndungu, of ID number, elected member of Parliament for Juja constituency, would like to tender my apology to the House leadership and my colleague members of Parliament. I understand we are living on a very dynamic and sensitive times, and my utterances in the past may have caused some problems in the country. I am remorseful and humbly seeking for forgiveness. As an ambassador of peace, I pray that peace do prevail in our country. God bless Kenya. Order. Today, honorable members, at the rise of the House Business Committee at 1.45 p.m., I did call the Honorable Kuimburi to ascertain his authorship of the letter. The Honorable Kuimburi did confirm authorship of the letter and further denied any claims that he had disowned the letter and its contents. The Honorable Member further indicated that he is currently away in Mombasa and unavailable to attend the sitting of the House until Tuesday, 30th July 2024. Honorable Members, 
Any allegation of corrupt practice, bribery, or attempted bribery is sustained on the privilege of the institution of parliament and deserves expeditious investigations and resolution. The practice and precedents applicable of the House require that any issue touching on the privilege of the House should be dispensed with as a matter of priority. I fully appreciate the pain and discomfort that the dependence of Honorable Koimburi's allegations continues to cause the affected members. However, I have reluctantly allowed the Honorable Koimburi to avail himself to the House by 2.45 p.m. on Tuesday, 30th, July 2024, to explain his actions with regard to the complaint raised by the affected members and the context of his apology letter in the manner contemplated by the Parliamentary Powers and Privileges Act 2017 and the standing orders. Thereafter, I shall guide the House on any subsequent actions to be taken in the matter. That is accordingly guided. The House is accordingly guided. I thank you. Yes, uh, Majority Leader. Honorable well, Speaker, thank you for that communication. Honorable well, Speaker, we are well guided as to your directions on Honorable Koimburi. But Honorable well, Speaker, I'm a bit concerned because last evening, a gentleman from uh, his office, who I'm told is his uh, constituency office manager, delivered a copy of that letter, and the letter indeed you are alluding to, you will see, is also copied to the office, offices of the leader of minority and the office of the leader of majority. Honorable Speaker, I was able to check after the House Business Committee this afternoon, when you raised the matter before the House Business Committee, that indeed the Honorable Koimbori's PA, when he delivered the letter to my office, the copy that was stamped in my office had only one stamp. But the PA had another copy which was stamped twice, because at one instant the rubber stamp was upside down, and therefore it was stamped twice. And members will note, and Kenyans will note, that that is a letter that was circulating on social media, because I had to take uh, great offense with uh, my staff uh, when I suspected they had circulated a letter on social media before I even saw it myself because I was seeing it when I was already home after 8 p.m. But, Honorable Speaker, what worries me is that immediately that letter circulated on social media. The Honorable George Coimbori, on his own Facebook page, stamped it fake and said it was a fake letter. Honorable Speaker, it is the same letter that you are now alluding to, and you assert that you have spoken to the Honorable George Koimbori, and he confirmed it was his letter. Therefore, Honorable Speaker, even as the Honorable George Koimbori comes to shed light on what he said on the matters that were complained to, I think his behavior last evening, today, and the days before that, Honorable Speaker, brings into disrepute not just his image as an honorable member of parliament, but also the integrity of the office he holds honorable speaker. And maybe we will wait to hear from him, but I just wanted to bring it to the attention of the House, the uh, kind of member we are dealing with, so that even as he comes on Tuesday, he can also clarify as to whether <laughs> these letters are fake or... Uh, he tells you it's fake. He says on social media it's fake. He tells you he's the author of the letter. We don't know which George Coimbori to believe. The one on social media, the one in churches, or the one who will be here. Therefore, Honorable Speaker, we'll wait for him. But I honestly do not know who the member for Juja now is. He has too many faces to be able to tell who the, the member is, Honorable Speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for giving me a chance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to support uh, whatever the leader of majority has said. And Mr. Speaker, when you look at the letter that was circulating in the social media, together with whatever you have led, Mr. Speaker, it does not even detail the reason as to why he's giving an apology. So, Mr. Speaker, 
Later on, Mr. Uh, Honorable Kaibori may say that he was not giving an apology on the level uh, of the issue of the two million. So, Mr. Speaker, that letter is a bit ambiguous on the state as to why he's giving an apology. Mr. Speaker, we want to have, if at all we are to agree, a letter that is talking of an apology over an allegation that the members were given two million. But that one is fake and a bit ambiguous. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is a house of traditions. And that's why we are called, this house is called the August House. Mr. Speaker, this member has made a number of unsubstantiated allegations against individual members of parliament, against the 13th parliament, and against everybody. As much as that apology, on the face of it, as a human being, I may be tempted to accept. But Mr. Speaker, because this thing has been so much circulated, and it's all over, I want to beseech you to refer this issue to the Powers and Privilege Committee so that that document is properly subjected to Justice. Justice means I want to go and appear as a witness and say the pain and the agony that I went through as a member who has been included in that particular bracket. So, Mr. Speaker, taking into account that this member has been flip flopping also, I'm sure next time you will say he did not speak to the Speaker. And we do not want the integrity of the Speaker to be put on question. So, I want to agree with the majority leader. For us to be fair, for us to be contented, for us to be satisfied, we beseech you to refer this to the Powers and Privileges Committee, and it will not only deal with this issue, it will also deal with any other member, any other will be member who will be casting as passion on the integrity of this House as a House and also individual members. So, Mr. Speaker, I speak to you. This will also give us an opportunity to amend if there are issues that we need to amend in the current standing orders or in the Powers and Privileges, so that this House remains a respected House in line with the letter and uh, spirit of the current constitution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Dr. Mutunga. Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, I believe strongly that the Honorable Koimbori was in his normal senses when he stood on the pulpit of a church and made the allegation. On our speaker, the follow-up activities do not in any way indicate that Honorable Koimbori was remorseful. I believe it is because your office contacted Honorable Koimbori that he has even written the vague apology letter. On our speaker, that is not true, Mutunga. On our speaker, my office spoke to Koimbori this afternoon after... Okay. Honor issues speaker. were raised in the Kamkunji. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, for the correction. But let me uh, adjudicate my point. Honorable Speaker, this letter has cost us a lot of pain and a lot of expenses. Wherever we go, Honorable Speaker, we are required, first of all, to deliver the two million before you can start doing anything. We are in a situation where members of parliament are branded in this country. And the circumstances under which this allegation was made were very, very severe. Honorable Speaker, we are in a situation where we need to redeem our image, and the Honorable Koibori only put fuel on a burning fire. Honorable Speaker, I think we do not need Honorable Koibori to come and give us stories here. I know, Honorable Speaker, you have the discretion, but the House, the, the, the committee, should be given the responsibility that we may be able to go and tell Honorable Koimbori what we have gone through so that he may be able to suffer a bit because he has subjected, subjected us to a lot of suffering. Many people have lost their property because of such allegations, Honorable Speaker. Mama Nairobi. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, for giving me this opportunity to contribute. Honorable Speaker, out there in the public, everybody thinks that Parliament has been under state capture. And when you have a member of parliament that goes out there and says that he was paid two million shillings to vote, uh, to vote uh, yes, and he declined, and he vote, uh, and he declined, 
uh, it, may, it means that parliamentarians are not able to make decisions on their own. It takes me back to 2023. I made a decision to support the finance bill. In the social media, everybody said I had visited State House and I had gotten a package. I never visited State House. I have never met the President on a one-to-one. -one. I have only met him in public functions. I think that when an honorable member makes such a statement, he should be put to strict proof. As a lawyer, I'm sure you understand that. If he cannot actually substantiate whatever statement he made in public, and we forgive him without him actually withdrawing and apologizing and saying he lied, then what it means is that we are coercing him to actually uh, withdraw. We don't want him to withdraw. He said he was offered two million. Let him prove to us who offered him two million. If he lied about it, then he should be punished because whatever he said out there implicates every member of parliament. When I make decisions here, I make decisions based on my own reasoning, my own objectivity. Sometimes I've even gone against my own party. That means I'm not able, if I'm in parliament uh, as an opposition leader or government, I am not able to lose my objectivity as a citizen. And I think it is important that all of us in Parliament stand and affirm whatever it is that we say out there in public. And I really would feel ashamed if he was just forgiven and he came back. Because whatever he said there makes it very difficult for us as parliamentarians to actually stand and say we are not bribed. We actually oversight this country's uh, various institutions. What, 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 what people are seeing right now is abject uh, corruption that is, not, uh, that is not actually being dealt with. And this corruption is not because the parliamentary oversight committees are not doing their job. It is because the reports that we make as parliament are not moving forward. And I think it is important for us as parliament to look at all the reports that we have made over the years that actually call for the prosecution of various members of public entities and the entities that have failed to actually address, uh, address the corruption that we have oversight. So for me, I really pray and hope that we shall actually make sure that this member of parliament is put to strict proof on the two million shillings that he got. He really, if, unless he's suffering from amnesia, if he never got an offer for two million and he just went out there and made a, 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 an allegation that implicates all members of parliament, then he should be punished. Wamumbi. You are the last one. Wamumbi is the last one. Give the mic to Wamumbi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for giving me this opportunity. Mr. Speaker, we have heard you loud and clear. Mr. Speaker, we are requesting you. We don't want Kojibori to come and give an explanation. We heard what he said. Mr. Speaker, for these members to redeem their image and their dignity, Kojibori must be punished, Mr. Speaker. For this house to continue, Mr. Speaker, Kojibori must be punished, Mr. Speaker, because these members need to redeem their dignity. And those members who also voted no, they also need to tell us whether they were paid to vote no. We voted yes on our own volition, Mr. Speaker. So for this House to continue, for these members to redeem their dignity, Koibori must be punished. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order, honorable members. Order, honorable members. I did say that I shall guide the House on any subsequent actions to be taken on this matter. Next order. Next order. Order number four, petitions. Order number five, papers. Majority Leader. Yes, the mic. Naomi. Yeah. Honorable Speaker, I beg to lay the following papers on the table of the House today, Tuesday, July 23rd, 2024. One, supplementary estimates, one for the year 2024-2025 from the National Treasury and Economic Planning and the following accompanying documents. A, program-based budget. B, recurrent estimate. C, development estimate, volume one and volume two and this statement on, uh, on, on financial year 
2024-2025, supplementary estimate number one. Two, legal notice number 105 of 2024 relating to the income tax, charitable organization, and donation exemption. Rules 2024, including explanatory memorandum and the evidence of public participation from the National Treasury. Number three, legal notice number 109 of 2024 relating to the road maintenance levy fund imposition of levy. Order 2024, including explanatory memorandum and reports of the public participation from the Ministry of Roads and Transport. Number four, report of the NGCDF Board on Project Proposals, Approved Disbursement Status, and Restrictions Imposed on Constituency Account, the third quarter of 2023-2024 financial year. Number five, price stability target and economic policy of the government for the financial year 2024-2025 budget from the national treasury number six the june 2024 special audit report of the auditor general on debt servicing of external loans in kenya and number seven the june 2024 special audit report of the year general auditor general on the implementation of the Global Fund program in Kenya. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, and I beg to lay. Order, Honorable Members, order. Order, Honorable Members, Honorable McClub. Who is the member talking to Honorable McClub? Take your seat. The House is in session. Honorable Babo, you know, take your seats or risk. Those who are walking out for their coffee or conversations, do so without disrupting the proceedings of the House. Chairperson, Budget and Appropriations Committee. Is Honorable Ndindi Nyoro here? Yes, Mary Masse. Are you ready with your... with your report on supplementary estimates? You can do it later. Get in touch with your chair. Next, Chairperson, Departmental Committee on Trade, Industry, and Cooperatives. Honorable Speaker, I wish to lay, uh, I beg to lay the following paper on the table of the House today, Tuesday, 23rd July 2024. That is the report on the Departmental Committee on Trade, Industry, and Cooperatives on its inspection visit to the new Kenya Planters Cooperative Union or new KPCU warehouses in Nairobi, Sagana and Meru. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Uh, next, Chairperson, Departmental Committee on Finance and National Planning. Member for cases. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Speaker, I, be, uh, I beg to lay the following paper on, on the table of the House today, Tuesday, 23rd July 2024. Report of the Departmental Committee on Finance and National Planning on its consideration of the President's Memorandum on the Finance Bill, National Assembly Bill Number 30 of 2024. Thank you. I beg to lay. Order number six. Next order. Order number six, notices of motion. Honorable Emase, we wait for your chairman. You will be given an opportunity to table and give notice of motion. Chairperson, Departmental Committee on Trade, Industry and Cooperatives. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to give notice of motion. Uh, I beg to give notice of motion of the following motion, that this House adopts the report of the Departmental Committee on Trade, Industry and Cooperatives on its inspection visit to the new Kenya Planters Cooperative Union or new KPCU warehouses in Nairobi, Sagana and Meru, laid on the table of the House on Tuesday, 23rd July 2024. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order.
Order number seven, questions and statements. Next. Next. Order number eight, motion. Public petition on funds spent contrary to the provisions of Article 223 of the Constitution. Resumption of debate. Okay. Honorable members, we are now at order. Order members, we are now at order number eight, public petition on funds spent, conduct provisions of Article 223 of the Constitution. Order my record shows that Honorable Nimrod Mbai moved the motion. Honorable Janet CTNA seconded the motion. The question was proposed, and then there was a member who claimed there was no quorum. So we now open to debate. My screen has nobody wanting to speak to this. Mover Nimrod. Where is Nimrod? Janet CTNA. And most Honorable Dr. Makali Mulu. Yeah, thank you very much, Honorable Speaker, uh, for this opportunity to add my voice uh, to the debate on this important report, the report which has been tabled by the Committee on uh, Special Programs, which is chaired by Honorable Muliungi, the MP Mwingi Central. I want to start by thanking the committee and all the members for this good work. I think this is the second report we are debating from this committee. And this report is specifically for constituencies in Bungoma County, Honorable Speaker. I think, Honorable Speaker, this, uh, this approach of looking at one county and all the constituencies in that county, in terms of looking at how CDF has been spent, is a very good approach because neighboring constituencies have a lot of things to share. When I listen to this report, Honorable Speaker, I've just been trying to think through what uh, happened in the Senate about two weeks ago when they were debating NGCDF, the National Government Constituency Development Fund. And as I watched the Senators discuss this matter, Honorable Speaker, I saw a lot of ignorance in terms of what CDF does in different parts of this country. And I could see people were debating from a position of lack of information. Honorable Speaker, we have amended the CDF, the original CDF Act many times. And we've, we've even amended the, the National Government CDF Act about three times now. And one of the things which has happened to this Act, Honorable Speaker, is that the Member of Parliament initially used to be a patron of that uh, the, 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 the NGCDF. And at that, there was a provision for what we used to call an oversight committee, where the MP was the chair, and he was expected to nominate other four members, so that the oversight, the, 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 the CDF implementation. But the latest amendment, Honorable Speaker, we did away with that oversight committee. So as we are talking now, a member of parliament is just oversight CDF, just as he does with all the other national government projects. And I think this committee, this committee of special programs, should be able to bring these matters out clear so that those Kenyans who are ignorant are not able to get the information from the, from the latest amendment 
can understand what is happening. So when it comes to CDF matters, Honorable uh, Speaker, it is a board which oversees implementation on day-to-day -day basis. And the only time a member of parliament comes in is when you are doing public participation to identify the projects and programs to be implemented. On that basis then, after public participation, the board takes over the implementation, the member of parliament now becomes a person who oversights the implementation. And it's on the basis of that that anybody who wants to associate a member of parliament fully with the CDF is a person who is misinformed. And I want to urge our colleagues in the Senate to take time and look at this act so that they are updated in terms of how CDF is structured. But listen to the report, Honorable Speaker. About three things have come up in the recommendations. One of them is a matter of land, where we are saying uh, the committee went out there and was not able to get title deeds for some of the land where some of these projects have been uh, located. And I want to really urge my colleagues in this committee, the truth of the matter is in this country, some areas have no title deeds. Land has not been uh, titled, the, 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 the title deeds have not been given to, to the landowners. And what people are doing is, people would know that this is my land, and they are waiting now for issues of land uh, surveying and all that to be done, so that they can get their titles. In such a situation, what is happening? What normally happens is, you will come to me as a landowner, and we do an agreement in the presence of their local assistant chief, so that he's satisfied that that land has been set aside for public uh, utilities. And it is on the basis of that, then I will be able to locate a school, uh, an assistant chief's office there, and any other project we are doing. So in a situation where documentation has been done and is filed, I think as a committee, you should be able to appreciate the fact that land title deeds are not all over the country. So in that case, even as you say, you are not able to find the title deeds for the land, it would be important to, to tell us whether you are able to get any other documentation to confirm that that is public land. I think that is critical. And like where I come from, my area, that's what we have been doing, that we will ask the owner of the land to sign documents in the presence of the assistant chief, so that even as we process the title deeds, we don't delay implementation of projects which have been identified by the public members, by the members of the public. The other point which has come up with the issue of uh, documentation, where you are saying you go there and you find that there is no uh, accounting document to support the expenditure. And I think this, pro this, this recommendation was also part of the other, recommendation the other report, where you are saying as you travel and visit different constituencies, you realize that fund managers are not able to present you with the required accounting documents. And I think really to me, the way I look at it, this could be a very deliberate move. Honorable Obiri, and I want to thank you for the moving because you know we belong to the same party. You have moved this report very well. So what I want to say is, this could be a very deliberate move because most of our fund managers, honorable members, are people who have a background in terms of professional background, either an accountant or an economist. And actually one of the basic criteria for recruitment is that you are able to prepare books of accounts. The other thing, CDF does not operate as a, a, a separate, uh, 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 what do we call it, this book where you, where you record expenditure. Uh, is it cash book? They don't operate a different book. What happens is there is a district accountant who is posted there by the Ministry of uh, Treasury to, to oversee uh, accounting works. On that basis, Honorable Biri, I will not believe when you say that people are not able to provide accounting documents because they don't have what it takes in terms of capacity. I would want to agree with you that they are not able to provide those documents because they are doing it deliberately so that they cover some of their wrong moves in terms of financial accountability. And to me, that's why we would want to see a, a more stronger recommendation saying that in situations where people have not been able to account for such a money, then you either hand those people to the Auditor General for further investigation or either to the DCI for, for further investigation. So that in that case then, we all these fund managers are accountable for purposes of implementation of our projects. And we have to bear this in mind. It's important I say this, Honorable Speaker. Most of these fund managers are not locals. They don't come from that constituency. And most of them don't even don't, don't come from that county. So in a situation where you want them to misuse the money, you'll be taking away money from a specific constituency to the, another different constituency. So in that case, we lose big as members of parliament because 
if a fund manager Mr. Provinz resources, more likely those resources will be invested in another different constituency and not where the person is working. So even as we oversight this money, it is more have realized that we love our fund managers, but they must do their work professionally. To me, this, this is a very important point, that we don't lose it. In that case, then we'll be able to streamline this process. And honorable speaker, I want to say this. Before I came to this parliament, I was a monitoring and evaluation specialist. I've prepared a lot of monitoring frameworks. I've done a lot of evaluations. And I've done a lot of impact assessment of programs. I want to confirm to this country today that there is no other program in this country which is more impactful to the lives of our Kenyans more than NGCDF. I want to say that as a provision that line, that this program has had very positive impact to our people. And anybody who thinks you can do away with the CDF, you might aid the member of parliament, you might aid the, the, the person overseeing the money, but if you aid the member of parliament, please, take the member of parliament out, but let's have NGCDF continuing in this country because it has very serious positive impact to the lives of our people. And I always say, Honorable Speaker, I'm, I'm sure you have, you, have, you have seen our constituents like me, and we joined this parliament the same day with you. If you look at what you have been able to do in the last 10 years with your 50 million every year in Oman Bay Town, Honorable Speaker, and compare it with what the governors have done over the last 10 years with their billions, it will be clear that what you have done has a high impact, has really helped your people, and it is visible as compared to what some of these county allocations are doing. So to me, I would be seeing as we were supporting a proposal that says, can we increase the money so that, because this money is having impact, so that we help our people more and more. And in that case, we'll be helping this country, and we'll be growing the local economies where this money is being utilized. So with those many remarks, Honorable Speaker, I want to support this report and say that it's time we even increase the allocation for CDF so that our people get value for money and Muslim public resources. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Julius Meli. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to support this report. And Mr. Speaker, from the onset, I want to thank the committee for coming out with such an informative, in, uh, very informative, very detailed, and a report with a lot of details, especially on uh, public projects. Mr. Speaker, the Auditor General's office is a very important government office that tries a lot, and I think this is very important for this House and for the country to know that, that office is for the good of the public. That the money that has been allocated to a public entity shall be made to good use. That the resources that have been allocated to schools, to colleges, to universities, and even to hospitals are actually brought to good use. Honorable Speaker, each and every other time when an audit report is read, at times, officers do not take it in good faith. It is a very important document. It is a document that tries to educate and tries to bring the public to know how their resources have been used. This report on NGCDF, which affected the constituencies in Bungoma County, actually resonates across the country, especially on certain issues. That one, CDF or NGCDF, as it was renamed, is a resource that has enabled government funds to reach the remotest parts of this country. It is a fund that has a very clear structure on how it is being managed. CDF has seen constituencies build several schools, several projects, police stations, and even earlier on, before devolution, constructed dispensaries. Mr. Speaker, before the, before the founding of the NGCDF fund, government resources were actually not being felt in the local areas. Today, you can be able to see a classroom, you can be able to see a toilet, 
you can be able to see a, a police post, and I can enumerate a number of them as a result of NGCDF. The structures that have been placed in NGCDF are actually structures that are not expensive. This is, a, this is a, an example of a devolved fund that is working. Today we can see billions of shillings have been devolved in counties. But because of the nature of the county government structure and how it works, the county government structure is very expensive. But the CDF structure is very lean. It has about five or six employees. It has an NCCDF committee led by the chair. And every other time, they sit depending on an allowance, which is less than 2% of the total cost of the resource fund that has been allocated to that particular constituency. In effect, Mr. Speaker, the NGCDF fund is a fund which is the most visible fund across all constituencies, all counties, and even all sub-counties in Kenya. It is through this fund that we've seen students who are orphans be able to go to school. It is through this fund that we have been able to see a number of football or uh, sporting activities actually running across constituencies. It is in the same fund that it has enabled even institutions which were hitherto then not known even in the country to have been built to become very big national institutions in names of secondary schools, in names of colleges, in names of institutions. I know a number of teacher training colleges. I know even a number of facilities in some of our local universities that has been put up by NGCDF. So, without enumerating so many, Mr. Speaker, the report that has come to, our, to be tabled this afternoon is quite informative and important. On issues that are, have been raised, for example, the issue of title deeds, I want to agree with the Honorable, Mule, uh, Honorable Makali Mulu that many areas in this country have not been adjudicated, have not ahead titles. But we cannot stop building schools just because those areas do not have title deeds. The greatest expanse of the, of the northern parts of this country and even some parts of the pastoral regions, land is still under communal. So we cannot just re uh, rely on the title deed as the only instrument to show that, yes, you have spent money on land, but the title deed has not been issued. We know of schools that have in existence for over 30 years. They are public institutions and they are running. Honorable Speaker, on the other issue that is very important, which has also been noted in this report, is that the accounting officers, who is the fund account manager, has to be held responsible. Because there is no fund account manager who cannot prepare audit uh, accounting documents. It cannot be an excuse. It cannot be allowed, and in any case, every expenditure has to be put in, has to be shown that the, 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 the money was withdrawn or actually was spent on item this or was spent on that particular project. And the, all the documentation has to be put in place. So I want to allow the, the, audit, the Auditor General's office and the committee for pointing out that Every fund account manager has to be held responsible for if they do not produce the appropriate accounting documents. And this one, it should, we should not take it. And I want to ask the honorable members that each and every officer has to make sure that these documents are well prepared, well placed, and they should always be presented when required for audit purposes. Lastly, Mr. Speaker, in MGCDF, and I want to ask members of the, of, the, of, of the Senate to note that this, there is no competition in terms of uh, popularity. Members of Parliament do not play any, any role in it. In fact, our role has always been oversight. Our role has always been to make it as successful as possible. 
The fact that they do not hold or do not have any fund does not warrant them to say this fund needs to be dissolved, this fund needs to be removed, or this fund needs to be discontinued. It, if it will be discontinued, it will be to the detriment of the Kenyan people. Hundreds of thousands of schools, Mr. Speaker, and I think we've been together in this house for the last over 10 years, have been constructed courtesy of NGCDF. Every year, I think I can take an example of my constituency where I used to have about 70 primary schools. Today we have over 130 primary schools. I inherited the constituency when we are about 16 secondary schools. Today we have over 40 secondary schools, almost 50 secondary schools, courtesy of NGCDF. That is not about an individual. It is about the community. It is about what are we doing. Right now, there are several uh, police stations that we want to construct. If we are going to rely on the, uh, on, on national, the Ministry of Interior, it will take ages for us to construct police stations. So this particular fund, I want every member of the, of the, of the Republic to know that it is a fund that goes down to the poorest child in the village to enable them to take her bursaries, to enable them earlier on to have dispensaries, to enable them to have what it takes to reach that particular household. The only thing that we need to do as a, as a house is to really entrench it, make it stronger, make it efficient, make it accountable so that the officers who are oversighting this fund, including members of parliament, we are ready to be accountable for it. Even the fund accounting officers, they really need to make sure that this fund is above board. And I want to tell you, Honorable Speaker, this is the fund that is going to leave a legacy in this country in terms of devolution. Even it is more effective than what the county governments are doing. It is more effective than even the, 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 the funds that various governments have tried to take to the, to the rural people. Earlier on, during the Moya administration, we had the district focus for rural development. We've had the, 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 Kenya, the various funds like Kenya Women, the Wezo, and all the rest. There is no any other fund that can be equated to NGCDF in terms of impact, both socially, economically, and even in terms of political impact. And I want to ask the House that as we look at the Auditor General's report, as we look at the, at, uh, the, 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 the committee of the, the fund account committee's report, let us look on how to make it more entrenched, more uh, constitutionally viable, and to make sure that the laws that we have are actually for the people and to the benefit of the people. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, maybe just uh, before you do that, you know, there is the thinking that the role of a member of parliament around CDF is still as chair, patron, and those are the issues. I thought, as the chair of education, you should explain to them our role in oversight. More so now that we are considering an audit report yes. from the Auditor General yes. on a CDF fund in respect of constituencies. In fact, Honorable Speaker... Yes, I, so I, take a minute or two. Yes, one, one minute, Honorable Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to say this. And there's a lot of misconception, and I want to tell Kenyans, even as we are in these very difficult political times, Kenyans have tended to believe everything that is on the, on, on the phone, on the, on the social media, to, to the detriment of the nation. I want to say this. Members of parliament have no official role, or even any role in that NGCDF, other than to be oversight. In fact, Honorable Speaker, in the last uh, regulation that was issued, the member of parliament was supposed to be a member of an oversight committee of the NGCDF. He himself is going to oversight the NGCDF committee and the fund account manager. In fact, the fund account manager himself and the committee are supposed to identify projects where the public participates. There is public participation in identifying of projects. And more so, when you go ahead, you'll realize that the money is deposited in schools' accounts that are held by the school committee members, or what we call project committee members, which is called PMC. So 
the role of member of parliament as a chair, as a patron, as anything, is non-existent. And it has been propagated over time, Honorable Speaker, so that we actually give a bad name. That's why in English they say you give a dog a bad name and then you kill it. In effect, no member of parliament is a chair, no member of parliament is a patron, no member of parliament has any uh, of, uh, what do you call it, what, an official or a, a role in that particular thing, other than to oversight and to make sure that there is, there is a public good or that there is actually value for money in that particular institution. I rise and I support. Thank you, Honorable uh, Meli. Members, this is a very critical thing because people have been asking whether who audits or oversight CDF. And they end up by saying, if you've been watching what has, what has been happening, that members of parliament are implementing CDF. In the context of this, uh, I've had even people saying that we should kill CDF, including some members of parliament in the Senate. But without free secondary education, without subsidized university education, this is a platform for you to explain to people your interaction with CDF and how the structures of CDF indeed uh, act. Ultimately, it is for the people of Kenya to decide what they do with the fund. The Honorable John Waluke, followed by the Honorable Peter Masara, in that order. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker, to have given me a chance also to contribute on this important report. Honorable Speaker, I want to thank the committee for the good work that they have done. Honorable Speaker, the work of Member of Parliament and the work of CDF, Honorable Speaker, the work of CDF in this country, Honorable Speaker, it is seen all over. It has done a lot of work, Honorable Speaker, the money that CDF or constituents seek get is very little money compared to monies that the current government receives in terms of billions. And uh, there's no any one constituent, Honorable Speaker, that has received uh, money, even 200 and 20 th uh, million, but you can see the work, Honorable Speaker, buying the passes for the schools. Like in my constituency, Honorable Speaker, I have managed since I took over, managed to build uh, 27. Uh, primary schools in additional with what I got uh, that time during uh, Honorable Tangula when he was the, the MP for Syriza constituency. Honorable Speaker, when you compare, earlier on we used to build uh, dispensaries and in any constituency or sub-county, Honorable Speaker, there is no dispensary or health center that uh, the government can brag and say that they build. Those are uh, facilities of CDF before it was devolved, Honorable Speaker. And some of them, after they devolved the money, we left them to the government and they have never been, been finished. They are just there. But the money is the money come to the county government, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, the area which the government and auditors should check and audit properly is the money for the county government. Because it is not seen, we don't know, and we are just adding money to the county governments every time they cry. You see, like last time, uh, Honorable Speaker, two years ago, they demanded money for the sports, which we used to do to help our children, to facilitate them to play games. But now, since that money was devolved, Honorable Speaker, 
There's a very big problem in the in the in the counties or in the sub counties or constituencies, Honorable Speaker. Because these people, their work is to steal money. Honorable Speaker, there's a 